um, well, you might have seen them in other events presenting, um, but all of them do a ton of work behind the scenes to actually organize all of these events. Um, Jordan Scott and Carolyn Yam from Tableau, who support us with speakers, um, they provide the platform. And of course, um, the speakers today who volunteered a whole bunch of their time to prepare their, their talks um, and now dial it to, to present to you and share their, their experience. Um, a few housekeeping items. Um, we are recording the session. So if you need to drop off early, um, we will post it to YouTube and send out the link in the next couple of days. So don't worry about that. Um, you also have the a possibility to view the seventh previous events on YouTube and um, and pick up on everything that you, you missed out on. Um, feel free to use the chat um, to talk to each other, to discuss things, to comment. Um, just please keep in mind if you have questions for us, for the presenters, please use the Q&A feature. Um, you'll see that the chat might get quite busy and questions might go uh, under and we might not be able to follow up on them. So please use the Q&A um, and enter any question you might have for the speakers. And then at the end of the session, um, we will try to try to answer as many pos uh, questions as possible. Um, with this, um, I want to hand, hand over to my co-host for, uh, for tonight, Fred Najar. Um, Fred is a Tableau public feature author and a very active member of the community. Um, if, you, if you follow on, on Twitter, you might have seen some of his visualizations. Um, if you haven't, um, look him up on Tableau public. Um, he will um, co-host to, uh, today with me and introduce the speakers and ask the questions afterwards. So Fred, with that, I hope you're here and I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Alex. Hello everyone and thank you for joining us today. I'm super excited to introduce our speakers for today. Tonight's lineup includes a Zen master, an Iron Fizz winner, a Tableau ambassador and a talk leader. So stay tuned. Our first speaker for today is Sue Rod, and she will talk to us about dashboard design in Tableau. Sue Rod is joining us from Bangkok. She's a Tableau public ambassador for a few years now and an active member in the data community. Last year, Sirius was one of the community judges for Iron Biz Beta, and previously she was the finalist on Biz Game, which is a similar version to Iron Biz in Thai. Sirius first started her job as a data visualization specialist at a fintech company and have been heavily using Tableau at work for the past 18 months. Before that, she was she has been working in the financial industry as a data scientist for about eight years. Welcome to Rose, and over to you. Okay, uh, hi everyone from uh, okay, uh, hi everyone from uh, Bangkok. Uh, I hope everyone is uh, fine and wish the I wish the situations become better soon. Okay, for uh, my, let me share my screen and uh, okay. And about the, our topic that we are I'm going to uh, discuss today is about how uh, we decided to dashboard more are uh, effective and. Uh, is make and also make the tabboard server admin happy and our, yeah in terms of the uh, effective design right, we have to not just solely thinking how how we visualize but in terms of the performance uh, this have to be uh, good and safe to the tabboard server so uh, as uh, Fred recommend uh, uh, introduce me um previously I'm um, uh, I joined Tableau Publics as an ambassador for uh, our, a few years now, and uh, after after that, I, I start my career as a data visualization specialist uh, at a fintech company for a year. And uh, in my roles, I also uh, take care uh, about uh, take care of uh, building the dashboard and also helping the teams to improve the. Uh, performance of the visualization. So, um, in 
uh, back to when when I I start uh, designing the dashboard and, and Tableau part big way, right? uh, everything is uh, we don't need to uh, personally we uh, I don't need to care much on the performance and uh, how the server rendering or how it's computing the view. But in reality, when in reality when we back to work uh, and especially when we have to host the server by ourselves and our resources is done by our, our uh, teams or by the company. So this is why you have to think more in uh, and decide uh, the layouts and uh, all the components on the dashboard more uh, effectively and more friendly to the user. Okay, so now I uh, so overall today I will talk about uh, that the reason that's why the two parties are, are not unhappy and what makes Tableau admin unhappy and how can we balance the designs and the performance. And uh, for the last topic, it will be about a checklist that uh, we should uh, think about before we deploy our dashboard. Okay, let's start with the uh, first topic. Uh, why the two parties are not happy? Okay, overall, it seems like uh, everybody have their own goal, right? For uh, Tableau admin, uh, scalability and optimizations always come first in uh, because uh, in uh, the long run, it's have to make everything become fast and uh, able, able to scale out or even uh, it, when we have to serve to the business user or even sell uh, the dashboard to the viewer. So everything have to be good and have to be very fast because uh, for example, if uh, one day a viewer enter to uh, to the portal right and uh, see the dashboard and they have to wait for maybe 30 minutes to to wait until the dashboard finish loading every, and this seems to be a very bad experience for a user. And uh, in some company, uh, they have their own goals, uh, also have their own, the, the goals as well, that are, uh, the dashboard may have to load within a certain second. Some company may set like uh, five seconds, six seconds, or, uh, or even 10 seconds. And uh, in terms of uh, the size of the Hypo file or the extract file, it should be uh, it should be it should not it, uh, it should not be uh, so big. Even though uh, we all know that the extract file are very helpful and help us to reduce the size of the file, but uh, imagine if we dump a lot of files into the Tableau server, it can uh, the disaster can 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 happen in one day and. Uh, in terms of the complicated of the view and the calculation, uh, it should be uh, simplified and are able to uh, load and help the performance become faster. But while um, the designer, uh, I believe that uh, many companies or, or many the dashboard creator may have uh, are quite similar, the, quite similar perspective for, for designing or building the dashboard. As far as uh, I believe that the designer, they want to cover all the business perspective. For example, um, uh, if you will do the visualization related to the customer, you may want to uh, cover uh, maybe the customer journey in the first dashboard and the next dashboard may be the house or uh, how's about that behavior, how about how about the spending? And then uh, maybe the next one may, may relate it to the customer retention. So uh, it seems like uh, the user also want to cover all, all the things and uh, is make to make the viewer easily to find. And uh, in terms of the uh, end user, for example, or you may just the viewer. So when the new uh, we were or the new joiner come into the company. So uh, sometimes it's quite hard to find or thing or uh, get the information. So uh, normally they will come and ask, where can I get this kind of information? So uh, that's why the uh, designer want to combine or 
are uh, want to combine all the things, uh, all the things in into a single project. Mm -hmm. And in addition, uh, besides the uh, information and the business question that they want to answer, they also want to make it beautiful and sometimes also want to make it fast as well. And in addition, in terms of the complexity, uh, they want uh, the sources not to be com complex and able to uh, reuse or even uh, it's gonna be great if they can use uh, a single source to build a visualization. Okay, and, uh, but what seems to be our unhappy story for the table admin? Okay, let's start one by one. So sometime when uh, we designed the dashboard, right, the, uh, on my left hand side is about what we imagine. We always think about a simple design and uh, for example, the pink color uh, will represent the, uh, maybe the key, key numbers or the uh, matrix. So, um, uh, on, the, on, on my uh, left hand side is uh, maybe the idea of uh, templates or the layout that we imagine, but in reality it's maybe more complex or we it's maybe uh, even more complex on uh, the size or even the content. So, so the size of the dashboard may be uh, in the longer side and uh, because of, we may want to combine our all the information and all the business questions in a uh, single page. Mm -hmm. And uh, the next one is about the complex layouts. And uh, from my experience, right, I found that uh, sometimes uh, I found that many users, they uh, always put a, con con uh, a lot of containers and uh, then uh, followed by the sheet and the, the components of the dashboard. For example, uh, is the top one is maybe the uh, KPI, right? And we may have the uh, we may have the uh, pictures, a, a little bit logos on on the top, and then uh, we have the header, and uh, everything was wrapped by the container. But uh, because uh, from from my understanding, this is because our uh, is this it easier to move and uh, easy to, easier to adjust the layout? And uh, some of them may use a floating layout, uh, and and uh, sometimes this may have uh, so many graphic stuff. And from my uh, experience, I the uh, number the highest container that I found on on the Leo dashboard in 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 the company is. Sometimes I found that uh, it's have probably around uh, 20 or 30, which is too huge. And of course, it's not uh, really fairly in terms of loading and causes of the will, uh, the time of computing will become slower. Okay, and uh, the next one is, uh, will be related to the calculation and uh, uh, complex, uh, and the complexity of the data. Sometimes too many LD or uh, too many calculation or even uh, too many context filter. And uh, sometimes our uh, chunk size of data uh, and too many marks, mark types on chart can cause us all the slowness. Mm -hmm. Okay, and for complex chart type, right? Uh, and I will uh, focus on some type of chart. Some uh, too many marks or using very small granularity in uh, the chart, uh, in the chart type, uh, in the chart or tables can cause a soft slowness. For example, uh, you may want to find that based your customer, right? And sometimes uh, you use the uh, your your customer uh, location uh, part in the map, right? And uh, for example, it's it's uh, to me it's okay if we have if you don't have too much, uh, if you don't have too much uh, customer, but in reality, is uh, it's impossible that we will have uh, a few thousand or or even ten thousands customer. So in reality, is uh, 
scatterplot or even uh, maps sometimes is uh, having to to many of this uh, take time for computing the computing the layouts and computer view mm -hmm. and uh, complex chart, chart type and sometimes uh, for example the network diagram is uh, the way that we calculate may be are uh, a bit complex and are uh, even uh, using multiple layers of Sankey chart this can uh, it can cause us of the slowness because uh, we have to uh, calculate a lot of calculation and even uh, finding the uh, dot for each point to draw the line so uh, this part can uh, so this part can can cause us of the slowness of loading okay uh, back to uh, the way that how can we solve this kind of problems and how can we balance the design and performance so um, at the beginning of my journey I, I, uh, I, I was the designer but after I have to uh, improve uh, performance of the dashboard from even for myself or even for my teammates is have to uh, we have to uh, reduce some some uh, components or uh, even some objects. Mm -hmm. Okay, at first, uh, for the uh, number of ob objects. So, for example, I found that uh, I found that uh, but, uh, this layout, right? Some people always duplicate the layer uh, into the multiple sheet. For example, in this case, it may have uh, five sheets, and uh, and uh, this one is one. Uh, become one object and another object, right? So overall, this dashboard can uh, have probably around uh, 14 objects. But uh, but uh, what? Uh, and this one is just a simple layout, right? But if we decide it's, uh, more le to make it less complicated, we can uh, we may be able to combine this together and shows it in in a single sheet. In terms of managing uh, the worksheet and uh, managing the project, so in terms of uh, maybe in the future, other people may have to maintain your dashboard or even uh, changing something, it will be easier. And next, uh, having to uh, many sheet right and. Uh, this is uh, the. Uh, layout that we uh, think about, right? So, uh, and uh, in terms of uh, reducing the uh, containers, uh, some I, I found that some people would not always use the container to uh, break the space and uh, use it as the the space to separate the chart or uh, separate the uh, the topics, right? So to me, is this this one is not a good habit. So I I encourage everyone to use the padding more because uh, it's uh, easier to uh, to it's easier to use, and I think I believe it's more friendly. And in addition, are uh, in terms of using the uh, floating layout, and this one are uh, previously is uh, uh, that uh, that is. Uh, uh, someone uh, who ha has already tested uh, the performance of uh, using the floating layout and the uh, uh, fixed and the tile layouts. It seems like floating layouts is take time for it take longer time in, for loading. So uh, if it's possible, I encourage everyone to use the uh, to to use the uh, tile layout. Okay, and before. Uh, we finish everything, right? I understand that uh, sometimes you might prepare the data and you uh, you get uh, more feel and uh, make you feel comfortable before uh, before you uh, make the presentation, right? But sometimes you don't show it or use or really use it on your dashboard. So it's better to hide and use view and reduce uh, the context filter. So th this one will help. Uh, will have the dashboard load faster. Mm -hmm. And uh, in terms of uh, using the chart type, so for example, if we want to 
visualize the uh, density or even the distribution of uh, of uh, maybe the population on on your portfolio, right? So uh, I believe that some some kind of chart can be really helpful and also very simple. For example, uh, you you may use a uh, histogram to uh, visualize the uh, the uh, distribution of of the uh, uh, maybe the transaction amount. Uh, in, instead of using the bot plus, or even uh, for, uh, for the network diagram, it can it might be able to replace by the heat map table, okay? And instead of putting individual uh, latitude and longitude on the on the map, we may uh, equalize the map. Uh, we we may use the equalized map and uh, and reduce the numbers of the dot in the chart first and this one, I believe, is can be a uh, tips to improve the performance of uh, the map in case we really want to uh, visualize the uh, density or a distribution. Okay. And finally, before our before we deploy the dashboard, right? We may have the final checklist, and and uh, please say hi to the performance recording. Okay, for the performance recording, uh, for the desktop, right, is available on our help menu, and then go to setting and performance, and our start recording, uh, start uh, performance recording, and from the uh, tablet server, so you have you have to uh, add the question mark, and then uh, followed by colon, and then. Uh, Record underscore performance equal to yes, and uh, keep this uh, before this uh, session is generating. And so at this one, we can uh, from this method we can see the performance and checks. Uh, we check our dashboard as what seems to be the bottleneck and causes of the slow net. Okay, and yes, and uh, I think uh, this is our. Uh, I uh, hopefully this tip is uh, will be able to help all the designers in uh, uh, design the dashboard more uh, more e efficiency and also help the table admin to uh, tune up the table server easily and plan for uh, and able to plan for the resources are uh, um, much more better. Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, thank you guys. Thank you so much, Cyril Roach. Okay. You're welcome. We are very glad to hear from you and having you share your expertise with us today around scalability and dashboard optimization. Mm -hmm. A few questions that popped on chat, one of them from Subby says, hi, what about adding more actions to the dashboard? Is it going to slow down the performance of the report? Well, actually it's, uh, this part, I, I think it's also impact because uh, from the action, it's just the, uh, our in, terms of when, uh, in terms of the action, it's, uh, action is treated like a, uh, it's treated like a filter, right? So when you change the filter, it seems like uh, at the back end, you have to run the uh, command or change the uh, selection. For example, uh, compare with uh, when you write the SQL, right? And the, the SQL language, for example, if you want to select, uh, uh, maybe select stuff from the customer where the region equal to West, but when you change the filter, are the parameter also chain as well. So uh, this one is have to, uh, in terms of rendering and computing, yeah, uh, it's also need the, need the, uh, it's also added back and it also need the time to manipulating. But, uh, uh, and uh, this, this also related to your data, uh, the size of the data as well. And uh, if the, the 
if your data is so huge or your calculation is so complex, it will uh, become uh, slower. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Well, there are a few more questions in chat. I will leave that for you to answer. And I will thank you again, Hiroros. Okay, you are well welcome. Thanks. All right. So, our next speaker is Ishik, who will be talking to us about how to pick the right chart for your data. So, Ashish is, joined, is joining us from Mumbai, and he is the he is the leader of the Mumbai Tableau user group. Ashish is a data analytics consultant and a co-founder of Scatterpy Analytics, and he run, uh, runs a really cool Instagram page in data visualization. You can check it on Instagram. It's called Doing Data. That's D-O-I-N-G Data. And he blogs at doingdata.org as well. So make sure you check these two out. Ashish loves reading books about all things data, and his favorite author is Albert Cairo. Very good choice. Welcome, Ashish, and over to you. Thank you, Fred. So, I hope every, everyone can see my screen. So, hello everyone from Mumbai, and uh, I hope all of you are doing well and keeping safe. And uh, today's my talk is about a uh, little bit about designing, creating charts, choosing the right type of the chart to answer the right kind of business question. Probably in a lot of cases, what happens is that you have the right data, you have the right question, and you want to answer it. And you give the answer in the form of a chart, but uh, the story that you want to convey and the chart that is really try trying to tell the story, they don't really connect with each other. So in data visualization, it's very, very important that your talk, your, your chart should uh, convey the story that you're trying to tell to your business user or the public, whoever is the consumer of your visualization. So first of all, my, my talk is uh, heavily inspired by the Financial Times visual vocabulary that of course you can go and check online. And uh, I've been referring visual vocabulary for like uh, three years now. And in fact, I have a huge A3 printout of the visual vocabulary and stick in my drawing room. Another A4 printout that is stuck in my office wall. So kind of, you know, this uh, visual vocabulary is like a most important, single most important reference point for the data visualization for me. Now, how did I really start? Uh, in fact, uh, yeah. So I'm going to talk about the stack bar, heat map, trellis chart, and scatter, scatter plot only today because I will have uh, maybe 16, 17 minutes to talk about it. But uh, before I talk about it, I would like to tell a little story about how did I start making them. So. It was the Valentine's Day morning this year, and I was flying like from Mumbai to New Delhi, and I was getting bored at the airport. So I just quickly drew this drawing and shared on my Instagram. And uh, people liked it, but what was uh, more noticeable was around 60 to 70 people forwarded this image to someone else. So probably these were the data nerds who were trying to impress their girlfriend or boyfriends with, by sending this image. So kind of, I like this color theme, the, the pink, the green, the black. And uh, that's how I did my first post about stack bar chart and people liked this one as well. And this is how I have come up with the idea of creating these small chart uses guides for a uh, type of the chart and share with the other people. So not, not wasting any further more time, I will just dive right into the stack bar. So 
what really is a stack bar? I hope you can see the. Okay. So stack bar is really kind of a bar chart which is divided into a few parts and they are stacked on the top of each other. So if you really see, then what's really important here is that uh, these some parts and uh, the y axis here is some continuous variable and on the x axis it could be anything it could be like north east southwest or it could be january february march time something like that so this is how you build a stack bar right but uh, when you should use it you can use the stack bar when you want to show the contribution of few factors like uh, a versus b or maybe product product one versus product two something like that and you want to compare those uh, components across the time or maybe across the geographies or things like that there could be a few variation to the stack bar charts you can of course convert your, your absolute numbers into the 100 percent stack bar chart you can convert your stack bars into a diverging stack bar which could also take a form of maybe like a pyramid chart where so if you remember the population pyramid it's like male population female population and you put your age here children and uh, elderly and you get a chart like this so if you really think about it it's also kind of a stacked bar chart right or you could just subtract the actual values from their targets and instead of visualizing the absolute value you could visualize the variance against the time and or if you remember this week's makeover monday few people have created like a diverging bar chart so that again is another example of the stacked bar chart or um, if so here is the one important point to remember if your x axis is not a time maybe it's, if it is not the month if it is not the year but if it is something like name of the states or name of the product usually what happens is that when people see something from left to right and the values are changing the very first impression that goes to the mind is that they think maybe we are talking about a trend here but uh, if it's not really a trend these are some other categorical variables like state or something probably you can just flip your chart and instead of showing it vertically you should show it horizontal so it gives you two benefits the first benefit is that uh, now you don't your users don't perceive as a trend chart anymore and the second benefit that you get is that uh, if those, those categories have very long labels you can just you know fit them here so it solves like two problems at once Another way you could uh, use these stack bar chart is in histograms. Generally what happens is that uh, you put some bins on the X axis and you put the frequencies on the Y axis. But if you want to see across those frequencies, where is the distribution of category A versus where is the distribution of the category B, you can just put that category on the color and it will give you a nice histogram which also splits the distribution or frequency polygon into different categories so when you create the stack bar charts there are a few things which you should of course remember just do not fit so many categories into one so it doesn't become very hard to read if there is a very long tail of many small values probably you can club them together into something called others or something and you can put it there the second best practice that i just already talked about that if it's not a trend probably a, a horizontal one is better than the vertical one third i would say is not really related to the stack bar chart but as an alternative if it, sometimes what happens is that uh, if you are trying to show the trend and you want to keep the flow continuous because the stacked bar chart is like has a little gap between them if you want to keep it as a continuous so you have two choices either don't use the stacked bar chart at all and use a stacked area chart 
or you can increase the width of these stack as 100% so that there is no gap left in the between and it becomes sort of a continuous smooth bar chart. Other thing you could do is that if you're trying to focus only on one thing, on so on any one aspect of these stacks, probably give it a little bit of bright color and make all these colors a bit secondary, maybe a bit more subtle, so the user attention is automatically diverted to these highlighted areas. Next, uh, these are some of the examples of uh, the stacked bar chart that we just talked about. And uh, you can see it, of course, uh, this file is uh, on my Tableau Public. You can download it from there. I will share the link after the talk gets over and you can just go download with the file. You can play around yourself, right? The next chart type that I'm going to talk about is heat map. And uh, heat map is really beautiful chart. It lets you put a lot of information in a relatively smaller place and just you can spot many patterns and uh, many stories from one single chart and you can ask further follow-up questions and you can start answering them. But before we get any further into heat map, I would just like to draw a little, little bit of it for you so that you can really understand what's going on. Okay. So probably you have A, B, C, D. And you have Jan, Feb, March, April, May. And you have some values like 80%, 70%, 60%, or stuff like that. So depending on these values, you can actually put colors inside these boxes, something like this. And the higher the value, the darker the color, and the visualization that comes out is called the heat map, simple as that. So a one dimension here, one dimension here, and the continuous measure in the between is a heat map. So what can we can really do with this sort of visualization? Let's, let's have a look. Mm -hmm. Okay, so like I said, of course you want to have two dimensions and a variable, then you can see what's going on here. A few, how can I auto hide it? Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. So there are a few variations to the heat map that you can do. So one is the simple heat map that I just talked about. Probably it's a really effective chart, not too fancy or whatever, but it achieves its goal very nicely. You can add a little bit jazz to it and make it like a calendar heat map. So if you are visualizing, let's say sales from one, two, three, four, five, six, all the way to 31st March, all the 31 days in a month. And let's say your business doesn't work on every Sunday. So then your line chart is like, it goes smooth, then every Sunday it drops down. Then it, it comes back again on the Monday, it runs smooth, then next Sunday it again, again it goes down. So if you want to solve that problem, probably you can use a calendar heat map. It's like Monday to Sunday, first row, Monday to Sunday, second row, Monday to Sunday, third row, like week one, week two, week three, week four. So what happens is that all the Mondays, they come on top of each other. All Sundays, they come on top of each other. It's like a calendar, and then you can put the color on that calendar. Either it could be absolute sales, or if you have daily targets, probably you can calculate the variance, and you can put the variance on the calendar color. And any day when you miss the achievement, probably it can become red or orange. And when you perform well in the sale, probably, probably it becomes green or blue, whatever the color theme you have, chooses, you have chosen. Geographic heat map. So it was not an old feature of the Tableau. Uh, I think I saw it last time, probably in 2019, when there is an option of 
option of density made available in the maps and now you can put all the dots on a map you can put sales or something and then you can just choose the density so instead of creating a dot map it just blends all those values together into into one and it creates a nice map for you another way you can use heat map is that you can add the gradient background in your scatter plots or if you follow some of the work by rayan sleeper or ravi mistry then you will notice that they have in fact created an entire playground and if it's a basketball play playground then from whichever the point the most of the points are hit that is like a hot spot on the entire spectrum uh, and any place where there are not many points scored it's like a less highlighted something like that so these are some of the best practices which you can follow while creating the heat map um it's really important that you choose a nice color palette it's really important that uh, you don't you you always have to create a cross section it's not like you can put product categories here and product subcategories here or you can put quarter here and you can put month here it doesn't work like that it the, both of the dimensions should cut into each other these are some of the examples that i have created for you you can go and check them out so it's like and one more thing that i have done here is that i have sorted both of these dimensions based on the values so all the high highly profitable products and geographies have come here and all the products and geography is which are made loss making they are like on the other extreme of the end of the chart and this is the heat map density that i uh, density map that i was talking about so these are all different zip codes but they are blended into one and they are kind of creating a hot spot where you can look at and then you can ask further follow up questions from your visualizations if you you can put some action filters you can select these and something will happen and you will get your question answer next is the playlist chart also known as small multiple and uh, it's a really cool chart especially if uh, you are trying to visualize a lot of information in a very small place so how it really works let me show it to you so let's say you have a you have a small chart like this now you can put region on the filter like north east south west or you can put year on the filter like 2011 12 13 14 whatever so what happens is that at one point of time you can look at only one sna snapshot of this chart but imagine rather than putting north east south west on the filter you make a cut of it like this then you put year here 2012 2013 2014 and instead of now one chart you have like nine charts so you got it right not a very good drawing but sufficient to convey the message i guess so now you have these nine versions of this chart and you can compare all of them with each other and you can see any important differences and you can spot them and you can ask questions about them so you can have a couple of variations of the trellis like uh, you can see how the geography is changing over the period of time like uh, last 9 years trend or something you can create a correlation matrix where you have a continuous variable 1 variable 2 variable 3 and again you put those variables variable 1 variable 2 variable 3 and you can see the correlation between them it will also be kind of a small multiple you can have a 
a trend chart which could be split by region and product or something like that and you can see all these small charts at one time and you can spot the differences some of the best practices uh, while you make the trellis are these so of course when you are repeating a chart over and over again there will be multiple levels multiple axes etc so it's important that uh, you uh, explicitly note uh, you uh, notify all of them so that your user knows that this scale is also starting from zero and ending at 100 this scale is also starting from zero and ending at 100 things like those if this is like jan to december jan to december jan to december put them there but also make sure that uh, all these additional informations are not very very bright they should be very light and subtle in the color so that the main focus still remains on the main chart because you see usually in a trellis chart there are like thousand data points at a time something like that so it, it's already a lot of information overload so make sure that you are pointing the attention of the user to the right place finally uh, there are some of the examples that i created for the trellis it's like a space and it's like a trend and you can compare all of them with each other at the same time without changing or applying any filters or anything finally my favorite is the scatter plot simple enough used a lot by statisticians data scientists but uh, not a lot in the business dashboards and i wish more and more people use them in their business dashboards because they are very very effective at telling a story it's like you have something here on the x axis could be sales could be cost could be whatever but it has to be a number right on the y axis again it has to be a number because what we want to see here is the relationship between two variables so let's say you are running any marketing campaign then the cost of the campaign is here and after the campaign is run some sales is generated then the sales is here and you can put all the campaign one campaign two campaign three and you can compare their performances or see if there is any relation between the cost and the sales generated stuff like that there could be many many variations to this uh, so my favorite is a quadrant chart you it's like you put a variable here you put a variable here then put a ref line on the y and a, put a ref line on the x so that your entire chart is divided into one two three four low high 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 low medium oh sorry low high and high low four, four quadrants and your business users could interpret this chart as i want to follow one strategy for this seg segment i want to follow one strategy for this segment stuff like that you could also put size on the bubble and it it's like you now instead of two variables now it's three variables you can also put color on the bubble now it's four variables one two third is size fourth is bubble fourth fifth also could be now you you can use that the fifth variable in the animation you can put on the page shelf like here or something and you can you can play and if you remember the visualization created by the hans rosling something like that so the fifth variable could go on the animation some of the best practices to create a scatter plot is that you don't forget to give nice very light color grid lines not necessarily always has to start with the zero right so let's say if you have some kpi which is always like 1900 800 and it always varies in that very small range so it's not a very good idea to start with the zero you can start at maybe 700 and then you can mention that uh, it is starting at the 700 but also it's a bit controversial so make sure that you read about it a little more before you start implementing it of course and on the x-axis always comes whatever happened first kind of a cause and whatever is the effect or whatever happened later will come on the y-axis and finally here are some of the examples that i have created of course you can download and look at them and this is it thanks a lot thank you ashish thank you thanks for this very informative presentation i really like your way in explaining while drawing and especially the stack bars and and the heat map 
So that was cool to to watch you doing it live. I'm glad. A question came from for, through the Q and A by Cigar, which says, "What is the best alternative way to visualize stacked bar stacked bar chart with too many categories?" Interesting. So if you have a lot of categories, probably one way to reduce uh, the category noise is to club them into one and call it as other. Another way could be like uh, you do not create a stacked bar chart, but instead you can put a, 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 a stacked area chart so that so that all those small values they go on the top and they come as a thin line rather than creating a lot of noise in the stack because in the area if the values are so small they automatically go on the top and they occupy very small space and because it's a continuous chart there will not be a lot of noise the other could be like include small categories or exclude small categories or you can just convert into a line chart altogether I don't think, uh, or maybe line chart is not a very good idea. Probably you can just say exclude values which are below certain threshold and you can give it as a parameter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's a big challenge when it comes to too many categories and a lot of variations between, between the values. Yeah. Well, yes. thank, you for, thank you for the presentation. That was great. All right, so our next speaker is Neil Richards. And he will be sharing with us what he learned from creating the 31 visualizations during his 31 days of flood project that he started last month. Neil is joining us all the way from the UK. He's a Boomerang Tableau Zen Master and a Tableau Public Ambassador. He's also an active board member of the Data Visualization Society and Biz for Social Good. If you don't know, any what, what any of these means make sure that you jump on twitter check those societies and and those groups they're quite interesting there's a lot of work there neil also works as a an analytics center of excellence at groupon he focuses on visualization and community building enough hearing from me over to you neil okay Thanks very much. Um, thank you, Fred, for the introduction. I'm just going to try and um, share my screen. And yep. All right, so you should be able to see it there. So thanks again for your introduction. Um, I'm going to talk today about uh, 31 Days of Flood, which was a sort of self-imposed project where I decided to um, create a visualization a day on um, uh, one of my favorite albums. Um, I've got a lot to get through, so apologies if I go through um, quite quickly. So we'll start with, I mean, why, why flood? Or essentially, why did I just do this? Um, really, I was, I was stuck in lockdown. I, I still am, um, and I was just sort of spending a bit too much time getting a bit wound up by COVID and news and reactions and things like that, and I felt I wasn't really doing something constructive. So I wanted to set myself a challenge, something I could do um, one thing a day of throughout May. Um, so I'm gonna to talk to you about my, my flood visualizations. As I say, sometimes you get a behind the scenes of the Viz talk. This is really a sort of behind the scenes of 31 business talk so um, I'm going to go quickly uh, and uh, I apologize for that but I've got lots to get through. So I'm going to talk about um, first steps, likes, obstacles, order, details, you might see what I've done there. So how did it all get started? Um, if you know some of my um, public work and I've got a lot of public work but I love visualizing music but what I've done in the past I've actually visualized the music as in the notes and the patterns and the tunes um, this is one example I did um, looking at all the different sections of Parker Bell's Canon um, and in fact I've got a, an animated version of this set to music where you can see each of them um, sort of move through the tune. Uh, you might remember I've, I've done this on um, Handel's Water Music too. So I, I love to experiment in that kind of way um, but I wanted to do something a bit different. Um, 
and my ideas sort of started here. This was back in January this year. Um, ironically, one of the, the last times I was allowed out of the house. It seems a long time ago now. I was um, presenting at the London Tableau User Group, and I was sharing the, uh, the podium with um, Stephanie Possebeck. Um, now, Stephanie is one of my heroes and has been right from the start, really. Um, if you don't know her work, she's probably most famous for being behind Dear Data. Um, so you should definitely check that out, the, the, the book and the project that she ran with Georgia Lupi. Um, and she's done loads of other sort of brilliant data art projects as well. Um, so because I knew we were sharing a podium, I was sort of checking out her portfolio and other stuff she did. And I, I came across something that I wasn't aware of, one of her earlier works, which was she was commissioned to visualise an album. Uh, the album was by OK Go of the Blue Colour of the Sky. And what she did, she, she visualised not only the... Um, the, the lyrics and the structure of the album, and she also sort of visualised uh, in, in a way how that corresponded with the book. And the book is, um, the I, I think it's called um, The Influence of the Blue Ray of the Sunlight and of the Blue Colour of the Sky. So basically it's the book that the title came from. And she came up with half a dozen really interesting visualisations which formed the front and back cover. So that gave me the idea. Why can't I, why don't I visualise an album but just focus on the lyrics, the words, the structure. Um, I could probably have a, a lot of fun with that. So I, I went with Flood by They Might Be Giants, um, hence 31 Days of Flood. Now the nice thing is um, they're quite a nerdy band, which means they've got a great fan website. They've got all the words there. They've got, um, they've got all the, uh, the tunes rated as well. Um, I also went to that particular website to get uh, to use the Spotify API. Um, and I was also pointed in the direction of where I could get uh, the chords from as well. Um, I'm, I'm no guitarist, but somebody pointed me in the way of that. But 90% of what I used was just the words from the website. Uh, and if you want to know what tools I use, I use Excel. That's it. I don't have um, any uh, ETL tools, anything like that. I did a lot of typing, a lot of copy pasting, a lot of deriving my own data within um, Excel. So it was very much a sort of hand curated um, project of love, if you like. Um, so what did I do? Here's an example of some words of one of the songs, you, you may recognise it. Um, it started off by separating um, between, in this case, verse and um, chorus. Um, but then each line can also be a, 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 a data point. So you can see you can separate it to each line, also separate it to each word. I also considered each syllable of each word and I even considered each letter. And knowing that I was going to have 31 different visits, which were all going to use a combination of these, it just made sense to have one version of the data at all of these different levels. And even, you know, I mean, here's a, a sort of snapshot of, um, of that song. Even if you've got this, you can see that I've manually put in a whole load of stuff in the data just to make it easier not to have to consider in Tableau. So I've got things like the word number in the album, but also the word number in the song. How many times does it come in this song? How, you know, which, uh, which particular um, number are we at at this moment? So anything that I could um, calculate and verify and keep in, in the data, and I had a number of different data sets like that, um, I would do. So um, let's go on to likes. Why did I choose Flood and what did I like about it? Um, I liked, I liked the fact it had 19 songs. So that's going to give lots of variety. Um, and it's, it's quite, it therefore means there's a real variation in um, song length. Um, there's a lot of different structures. So one of the songs, and I always knew this from the start, one of the songs only has two words in it. And I thought, well, whatever I do, that's going to stick out like a sore thumb. That's going to show some really interesting visualizations. Um, the lyrics themselves, were, um, Stephanie in, in her visualisation tries to look at sort of themes, but there aren't really themes in this. The, the lyrics are sort of uh, are quite fun, really. You're, you're not going to get much about um, love and yearning and regret. You're more likely to get things about um, um, canaries and, um, and triangles and things like that. Um, and as I said, the, the very different song structure, some had a lot of repeated words, some had you know, mostly music, meant that I thought we'd see quite a bit of difference. I think the key thing, uh, and I'd say this about any person who you do, um, is just pick something you enjoy. I loved this album in 1990, and I appreciate probably a lot of you weren't even born then, um, so I'm sure my age, but I still do. I would still happily listen to this. It's been going around in my head all through May, um, and I still don't mind. So, oh, um, sounds 
obstacles and opportunities. Um, so the first obstacle is also that it had 19 songs, uh, for two reasons really. One, that's a lot of songs. You can get albums with eight, nine, ten songs. Why did I have to pick one with 19? Um, especially when a lot of what I was doing was visualising each song independently. Um, a, it's a lot. And B, annoyingly, for someone who loves small multiples, and Ashish has just uh, mentioned small multiples, it's a prime number, so it doesn't even fit into a nice grid. Couldn't it have been 20 or 16 or, or 8 or 9? Um, and it also made it hard for a, a colour palette. 19 is its too many um, you can't really get uh, 19 colors which are easy to distinguish. So I, I made the decision early on to go with the, um, the hue circle that you can get within Tableau. It sort of goes through the, a, a rainbow of colors and, and starts on a sort of light blue and finishes on a dark purple. So it can be difficult to tell two apart that are next to each other when you've got 19, but it's still um, quite a, a, a pleasing um, a graduation of colors, which is gonna stand out nicely on, on white or black. Um, now, routine, routine and threshold of acceptance, I'll sort of put them together. The routine was hard. I, I started with, with one almost done, and that has taken me sort of a couple of months of scrabbling around to just come up with an idea, and two or three half ideas, which I didn't really um, know how to finish. Uh, and I started with most of the data, to be fair. I've been doing that in the work up to it. So my routine had to be stay on top of it, so I always have these two or three spare. Don't try and get to the stage where you've got nothing. And that happened by about day 29, 30, but uh, up until then, I always had these spare. But I said threshold of acceptance. I knew that I couldn't come up with something that's a work of genius every day, but I also had to put out something I liked. And I soon realized that the reason I hadn't put out these sort of two or three spare ones was I didn't actually like them. So it always meant to me, if I couldn't come up with something that day, then I was gonna have to be forced to put out that that small multiple bee swarm, which I really didn't like. And you won't have seen that because I managed to sort of avoid doing that. But it does mean that um, you, there's always got to be a sort of certain level of what you want to put out. That's quite difficult. Um, well, two other things, uh, consistent viz sizing. I wanted to put it on Tableau Public eventually uh, and have it as different tabs going across the top. Uh, and by about day eight or nine, I did that. And I soon realized that Tableau Public will take the size of the largest dashboard of everything you put up um, and then it'll sort of put everything else up in that size. So I, I actually started with one that was far too big and it meant that all the others were sort of swimming in, in loads of white space. So I had to change that and sort of come up with the lowest common denominator. I realized that once I'd stuck to that particular dashboard size, all needed to be that dashboard size. Um, I ended up going 1800 by 1500, which in hindsight, had I thought about that right at the start, I might have come up with a different size. Um, and repetition, I won't say too much about that, but obviously it, I didn't want things to be too similar to each other. Good stuff. Um, it meant because I had 31 days, it meant I had more chance to just sort of try different data sources. So I brought in things like the ratings, I brought in things like the Spotify scores. Um, it was mostly the words, but it did give me a chance to, to bring in other stuff and to try, uh, try new stuff, try new chart types that I'd never even considered. Um, obviously, I wanted variety going through 1 through 31, so I was always looking to see what new things could I do. Um, and a lot of that meant looking outside of Tableau. I think four or five of the charts that I produced were from utilities outside of Tableau. Um, just because it's easier and it makes more sense. You know, don't try and do a chord chart um, when it's so easy to do in, uh, in raw graphs or um, one of these other things. Uh, there are existing things out there for inspiration. I always knew that I wanted to, to emulate at least one of um, Stephanie's uh, visualizations and there are one or two others that I'll, that I'll show you. And I put the band loved it, or in my head they loved it. Um, the reason I've said that, here's day two. Um, you can see right at the top, retweeted by They Might Be Giants, 133 likes, 30 retweets. I thought, right, crikey, I've got to keep doing this now. The band have seen it. I'm only on day two. People are looking. Um, and the other reason I wanted to show you this, not just out of vanity, although a little bit, was this was probably, this is just a, um, a tree map and it's full of multicolors and it's easy to do in Tableau. It's, it's probably not one that as a purist you would pick out as one of the good ones but it's one that people liked and got noticed. Um, and it's, it, it's just fun. It's fun to see how many times different words are, are used in different uh, songs. So 
early on it made me think look you don't have to sort of go for uh, really uh, majorly artistic things or, or majorly technically difficult things every time because people will like um, even just a, a dream map. So the next O stands for order and that means um, I'm going to just go through and show you each of the um, visits that I uh, put in. Um, I, I'm really just, we've got 31 of them, um, so I'm just going to go very quickly through because I'd like to um, show you a few sort of how-tos towards the end. But as I mentioned, this was this was sort of the one that I had, um, uh, first of all, that I launched the project with, very simple, just um, each word sized by the number of syllables. And we've spoken about um, number two here. Uh, and by now already I decided, right, I need to stick with this hue color um, uh, palette throughout. Uh, and I, I start with the, the Helvetica Neuer throughout. So it, I really had to sort of decide what my consistency was going to be through here. Day three, um, it was interesting. I first sort of introduced stop words here. So where we're looking at sort of words that actually mean something about from the A, the, and, and et cetera. I always call these steppy graphs. Um, John Byrne Murdoch, uh, amazing data journalist um, at Financial Times, he introduced that term when he was visualizing uh, legendary um, female tennis players in this way. Um, and it's a, it's a great pun for a great chart, and I will always call them steppy graphs. Um, but this, and, and interestingly, it just showed me that actually 75% of the band's name was actually a stop word, which I thought was fun. Um, Day four, I mean, this was quite fun really, because I tried a radial, but I had different things for X and Y axis, which meant things sort of overlapped quite nicely there. So I've got um, the, the, um, the number of words going one way, and I've just got the order of the songs going another. So it just made a nice overlap. And it's actually one of the first um, examples where you can see that line in the middle. That line is the song Minimum Wage, which just has two words. They just sing that, and then that's it, there's music. And you cannot make a circle from two data points. You shouldn't just make a line. So it's um, it's already sort of showing up that particular quirk and it actually came out sort of, um, really nicely as a talking point there. Day five, um, I tried to do some kind of um, badges, if you like, a little bit like a, a sort of Georgia Loopy style that, that I've done before. Um, I, I wasn't overly happy with this, but I could at least sort of show in a fairly sort of ge geometric way all sorts of um, different attributes from within the song. There's actually a, a separate one here on how to read this, uh, but I've got, you know, I've got all the different, um, uh, the singer information and instruments and things like that. They say, uh, another one, I haven't done a bubble chart in years. Bubble charts are bad, people will tell you. But but this was kind of fun. If you're going to use a bubble chart, use it for something as um, asinine as how often do people use words in different songs. You can look at this and you can see, oh, they say whistling and dark quite a lot in that particular song. And I got one, one comment said, I love this. It just shows that like, that word whistling is like the giant gumball that they just can't get back in the jar however hard you tried. So it, it's, you know, it's colorful, it's a bubble chart and it, it's maybe not great analytic practice, but. I'm not looking for great analytics here. I'm looking for something fun that shows word distribution. Day seven, this is one of the first I used, uh, which doesn't use Tableau. Um, I used Flourish here to, um, to create a chord chart. Uh, and this shows um, how often words are shared from, uh, or sorry, are used in um, more than one different song. And that came out really nicely. And I could do that in 10 minutes in Flourish. And probably if I'd have started this in May the 1st in Tableau, I'd still be working on it. Um, day eight, this is one of my first um, homages to a, another biz out there. This is from um, Tiziana Alocci. I um, apologize if that's not how you pronounce her name. She's um, done some, some great work and she also um, is involved in the Market Cafe magazine. Um, and you can see bottom right was her visualization where she visualized, um, I think it was an EP of German trance music. Um, I thought, right, well, I can um, emulate that by looking at word lengths um, regularly. Radial jitters for day nine. Um, this is quite nice because I was able to show those that were more packed had more words um, and those that were less packed didn't because the, the size of the circle is the length of the tune. Um, incidentally, if you wanted to, uh, if you want to do random, something that, that shows on both X and Y axis, that's actually quite difficult in Tableau because the random seed means that if you, if you try something random on X and something random on Y, it would use the same 
random seed, so it won't generate a true random. So the way around that is to um, is to go is to use an angle to go around your circle um, and then choose your uh, your random number for the for the radius. So this essentially it's going around and choosing a random amount um, each time. Letter bump chart, uh, nice and simple. This one. Um, Fun thing about this is, is for letters 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, the most common letters are N-O-P-L-E. So you can see the word Constantinople forming in there. And if you know one of their famous songs, you'll know why that is. Um, this one, I'll talk a little bit about this afterwards if they have time. Um, I call this a hydra, and, and this is all about sort of word repetition. It's the most perhaps sort of abstract of the ones that I've done, but I was um, pleased with the way that came out. We'll talk about that one later. Um, this is my only animated one. Um, so put all the words in the album order, but um, if I put them all in alphabetical order or in order by length, you can just sort of see a different mosaics, how they um, came through the, the songs. That was a bit of fun. And thank you to uh, Mark Reed, who was on the end of um, my messages that night um, trying to get, uh, figure out how to get animation to work. And 13, just a, another way of looking at things. I tried to do a sort of tree branch thing and, and it's a different kind of radial. And it's the first time I looked at the different um, sections of the song, uh, the intro, the verse, the bridge, the chorus and the outro. And it kind of uses the color palette from the album cover as well, because I'm moving away from uh, colors for songs. This is a different color palette. Same palette used for this stream graph. Again, uh, raw graphs does a really um, easy way of generating a stream graph for you here. Uh, you can see that pinch point in the middle, the, the two words song. I thought that came out really nicely. Uh, the 15, I just wanted to display the chords and this is just using polygons. So it's pretty much um, hand uh, curated, if you like, where I've sort of worked out where each of these points will go. And that's come out quite, um, uh, it shows sort of quite clearly which chords are used most in which songs. And I was asked, which is my favorite? And I think this is my favorite. It's probably the easiest. It's, it's literally just a, 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 a bar chart, although I've, I've, I've reflected it and made it look like um, sound waves. Um, and it, it's, it, it's done so that each of them um, goes to 100%. So whether it's minimum wage with its two words or whether it's one of the more wordy ones, um, and I just really like the way that this gave a profile of each song in a sort of uh, bright sound white wave kind of way. And you can see some of the characteristics. You can see Whistling in the Dark there, where they just sing about Whistling in the Dark constantly, all of the end and sing the same kind of words. So you've got that, that pattern. Um, and whereas others, you, you can just see its own sort of print. So it's, there's probably, there's nothing clever in here. There's nothing trigonometry. There's nothing radial. There's, there's no, um, there's very few tricks in this, but I was probably, this is probably my favorite. Um, another tree map for day 17. I just styled this differently so that we se separated it by song um, and I used it to show how often the title words were, were used. Um, day 18, I like this one and I'll try and show you how this one was done. Um, this, as I've often done, I've, this has been influenced by an album cover and it's been influenced by a different one of their album covers. Um, and, and I'll show you how I, how I made this. Day 19, I think is actually quite similar to, to the sound wave one. Um, but again, I just wanted to show the, the sort of distribution of words through each song um, and also highlighted in black this time where they ask questions in their, um, in their phrases. I thought that'd be fun. Uh, day 20, another um, radial one, but this time I'm going into the number of syllables. So you can see I've joined up the monosyllabic, the multi-syllabic words. Um, I make no apologies for doing a few radials here. It's, it's, it's an, it's an easy metaphor to use using a, a, a radial for music, but you know that when you've got CDs and um, albums and you're sort of going from start to finish, it just it, it's a it's an obvious way I think to to display these things. Let's go quickly through um, Scrabble. That was just a sort of complete one-off idea. Um, that was quite fun. Who'd have guessed that Shipwreck would score more points than anything else in the whole um, in the whole album? And I also realised they didn't use the letter Q once. Um, this went to flourish. Um, I, I tried a dendrogram of words. This came out really nicely, I think. Um, so it's separated by song and song parts, but you can still see a nice um, bar chart going around the edges there. This was my um, copy, if you like, of, of um, one of Stephanie Possebeck's um, visualizations. And as I said, because I knew they only used 25 letters, no Q, that's how I got my five by five grid. 
Um, and so that's what I've decided to break uh, each of these down by. Um, another one looking at the syllables in the words now, so it's probably quite similar to number one, uh, but, I, but you can see I've got um, longer um, bars and some of them can go around corners, which I was quite pleased with. Uh, this is my one look at the Spotify scores. So I looked at um, valence, acoustic, dance, and pop and just sort of compared them all. Um, I love a spiral. So this is where I've, I've spiraled according to word length, but I've, I've tightened it or loosened it depending on um, you know, how quickly those words come around. A bee swarm, after sort of giving up on my Tableau version, I, I found a, a version in raw graphs, which I think worked much more nicely. And I brought in all the, um, all the different ratings. Um, the nice thing about raw graphs is it allows you to size the different um, circles as well. So I was able to size it by number of uh, ratings from people. 28, I, this came out quite nicely, but it's actually just a stacked bar. Actually, it's just told you lots about stacked bars. Um, all right, 25 is not a great number of um, different colors and gradations to have in a stacked bar, but I've used um, the cube helix here. Um, it just disaggregated all of the lines um, and I've coloured them by song and sort of placed them pretty much randomly uh, and I've just sort of tried to emulate Plain Stupid which is by um, the Information's Beautiful Seeger. I was quite pleased with the way that one came out. Um, day 30, um, I'm trying a more colourful rendition of Oddity Viz. I could talk for hours about Oddity Viz, you should really need to, to check that out, which is a, a series of um, record visualisations of um, David Bowie's Space Oddity by uh, Valentina De Filippo and Miriam Quick. Um, but that one came out quite nicely and I actually used Procreate. I exported um, to Procreate to do the arcs by hand and then re-imported the image and put it towards the back. And that enabled me to um, sort of combine a little bit of, of hand drawn with um, Tableau created. And finally, day 31, uh, word clouds. It seemed like a, a nice way to end. All right, so um, I, I, I know I haven't got too much time. I, I want to show some really quick details of some of these. All of these can be downloaded from my um, Tableau public if you want to know how things are done, and you can always contact me. Um, I mentioned I was going to show how to do these, um, this sort of stylized bar chart. Uh, and essentially what that means is how do you create this in um, Tableau? So what I decided was that the, the straight bit from the, the sort of middle onwards, that would be, be a bar chart. So um, it would be, the length would be the number of um, seconds. And the, the width or the height of the, height of the bar, I wanted to do um, by the, the number of, of, of words per second. So essentially the thicker ones are wordier and the thinner ones are, are more um, musical. Um, so how did I create this? I decided that each of these needed to be a polygon for each song, uh, a decagon to be correct. So each song looked a little bit like this with um, 10 points in. So you can see on the top right, I joined with a very simple um, additional Excel chart like that, which allows me to plot 11 marks for each song. Um, you can see how they are there. 11 isn't showing, but 11 is a copy of one. It just means that they can, uh, you can fill in the gap uh, and, and therefore sort of colour in your polygon, so to speak. Um, so how did I draw this? Well, the X is not too bad because the X is going to be the same for every single song. Uh, so I just needed to judge um, the sort of approximate proportions, so that the, the, the first on the left would be about 85 in length, then going up to 100 and 135, and then just five and six would have, have the additional length of the song length there. So that wasn't too bad. Why one might look a little bit more complicated, I'm just gonna sort of really quickly take you through this, and um, apologies for the speed, but you can see here, Four and five, um, now alternative order, that's just the song number. I've changed the order because I wanted the long ones in the middle and the short ones in the end. But that's gonna be your number from one to 19. So I've just um, made the Y scale and then multiplied it by 100 to give myself some room to breathe. Six and seven, because I want the, the height of each of them to represent the words per second, I've added the words per second. Um, and I've multiplied that by 100, and because that then takes it over 100, if you like, um, so that it would overlap with some of the other bars, I've divided by three, and that gave me a nice amount of, of spacing. And then these next two, three and eight, if you remember the original viz, it's just the same thing, all sort of squished up to the top. So all I've done is I've taken whatever I use for four and seven, 
and multiplied it by 0 0.75. And then two and nine, again, I'm working backwards. I'm thinking, well, this is about a third as thin again, so I'm gonna multiply it by a third, 0 0.33. But then I'm gonna add 1100, because actually, instead of starting at the top, it starts over halfway down. And you don't have to get these exactly right. You can experiment with these and you can try different things and see how's it moved, how's it squished, how's it gone up, how's it gone down. And when you're happy with something, then it works. But I've sort of worked out from the from the bar and then done all the sort of stylized bits out. One and whoops, one and ten um, are exactly the same as two and nine on Y, aren't they? And then eleven is a copy of number one. So that's how I did that. Um, I wonder if I've quickly got time to um, just to say a little bit about this small multiple hydra. Um, what, what this was, this was uh, inspired both by the top right one there from Chris Love, where he looked at repetition in song words. Um, uh, and the bottom, I realized it looks a lot like this bottom right one, which is an awful graph really, but was doing the rounds a lot. Um, uh, it's a, I don't know, tornado busy, but like all about COVID. Um, a lot of people, when they did try to understand that, they would do it in small multiples and perhaps just sort of try and pull one colour out at a time. So that's what I decided to do. How do I create this thing on the left? Um, I'm going to just sort of try a, a, a one slide explanation here um, as we're coming towards the end. Um, so each of the points is basically comes from the angle and then I plot the sign and the cos of it using x and y. Now the angle is a running sum. so. I'm always sort of following the same direction. And then I had to decide, do I want to go one way? If it's the first time we've used it in the song, so I've moved it down by one. If it's the second time, we'll keep going the same direction. And if it's more than the second time, we'll start to go in the opposite direction. So what that means is, um, the more repeated it is, it's going to start curling round, uh, what's that, um, anti-clockwise. Now X and Y, a little bits of experimental. Um, I've I've used the sign and the cons and I've just added it to the previous value. So it just, it makes a nice path. And the parameters before that, that's me looking at how many times does this come into the song and how, um, how close are we to the last time that we've used it? So especially as we get some more repetitive ones towards the end, the, the, the parameter gets smaller and smaller which means it, the curl comes tighter and tighter. My sign and cos aren't taking it as far away from the one before. So again, a lot of fun just sort of trying this, trying different things, what curls it more, what, what doesn't. But the principle of it was to have this angle as a running sum, which is just gonna change from uh, word to word, and then using X and Y to plot off of this angle, and then we'll see it. And so many of my visualizations just use X and Y to kind of draw a graph like that. Um, my final one, I, I think I mentioned how, how I did this in the um, as I went through days 1 to 31. So again, it's okay to export to, to something graphical, uh, draw on that, and then import it back. So I could talk about all of them, really, but I think I've probably reached the end. So um, that is the end for me. Let's sneak out this glass of bourbon and we'll go. But I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Neil. Well, it was, wow. It's like the whole thing is amazing. Uh, it's really exciting to, like, to see all of these visualizations coming together. And I really love the whole idea behind the project and the album. And it's quite cool to learn about your learning process while you're doing this project. So that, that was great. I have, I actually, I personally have too many questions, but I will pop them in the Q&A section okay. now, as we are running quite short in time. And I will introduce Timothy. So thanks all, thanks all, uh, Neil, thanks for, for, for the presentation. And everyone, you can follow Neil on Twitter at the Neil Richard and you'll probably be able to see all of his visualizations or you can jump on Tableau Public and see and have a look at all of the 31 visualizations. All right, so our final speaker for tonight is Timothy. And one second, I'm just trying to share my screen. Share my screen. Gonna take all of it, Timothy. So thanks, Neil, again. So, Timothy, 
is going to talk to us quickly about their row about the data row level security for Tableau. Tim, Timothy is joining us all the way from Belgium. He's passionate about database and analytic and analytics consultant with a he's a comprehensive with a comprehensive and deep knowledge of Tableau. Timothy is certified in both Tableau desktop and server and versed in many related fields such as automation, embedded analytics, and center of excellence. His knowledge spans all aspects of Tableau products and at Visitory where he works, Timothy was the head of head of talent development as well. All right, so enough from me. I will hand over to you, Timothy. Thank you, Fred. I will take over the screen sharing just once more. Sorry for jumping yes. in just a bit too early there. That's fine, we can see your screen. Excellent, thank you. And thank you for the introduction. Um, yes, as um, inspirational and as creative as Neil's topic was, which I really did enjoy, um, well, this one's a bit more dry, you could say, because this is about security. And um, I know from experience that when you start talking to, um, to people about IT security, many of them will make their, um, like, you know, kid just ate a broccoli face, like, oh, security, do we really have to worry about that? And is that like, it's a technical, dry, boring topic, and I just, you know, wanna, wanna sp spread out the analytics that I've made and share them. Um, but you know, hopefully by introducing role level security and what that concept is to you today, um, I'll be able to slightly change your mind um, because you can actually use some of the techniques here to make well, mostly dashboards and visualizations that you build more interactive and more relevant to your audience than that they would be without. Um, and well, maybe the subtitle, I spy with my little lie, will become clear along the way because it really refers to the fact that, um, well, you know, I could open one dashboards um, and you could open the same and it'll look different to you than it will to me because of role level security, which applies the right context for me to see data that's interesting to me as opposed to other data that you're interested in. Uh, but we'll illustrate that concept along the way. Um, we will take a step back at first though, um, looking at row level security um, in a broader picture. Actually, let's look at security in Tableau first because it's not the only security aspect that is important in Tableau. In fact, we very often, um, I guess you could say we very often look at security from three different levels. Um, security is implemented in three different grains and that's um, at a coarse grain, at a medium grain, and at a fine grain. And this is, this is really specific terminology that's not always used that way, um, but it's the most common way of describing that, I think. And what will probably resonate even more than coarse, medium, fine with you is, you know, what we're actually securing in case of, you know, the coarse grain, that would be the widest possible item and that's the platform. We're, we're securing the whole platform. Uh, we can go one level down to the medium grain and would be securing actual content like workbooks and uh, data sources and specific views. But then even further down to the finest grain, we can go and secure what data is being displayed in one specific view or dashboard. And the tools we use for that um, are, are three different tools. Actually, it's a collection of different tools at every different level. Um, and specifically for the coarse grain, for example, we would usually um, we would usually call it authentication, meaning can I sign into ta to Tableau Server and am I allowed to access the platform in the first place? It's the first thing you would have to go through uh, in in the context of Tableau security to ensure that you're seeing the right things. And after that, after you after you did sign into Tableau Server, you can go one level down again, looking at authorization, which is basically just uh, permissions actually, um, permissions on projects, permissions on data sources and workbooks and views. Like, you know, once you're in Tableau server, what can you actually see? And then once you're opening a dashboard, and again, the topic for today, we'd be looking at the finest grain of security, which is uh, securing your data with role level security. So focusing on that, um, you should know if you haven't done this before, with Tableau or in any other context, because this is, by the way, not a, a Tableau specific 
uh, concept. It's, it's something that's widely applicable throughout data and analytics. Um, but if you haven't done that before, you should know that there are usually different options that you can look at uh, to apply role-level security. And then that's no different with Tableau. And those two options can actually be um, categorized in two main approaches. One is to use specific Tableau functionality called user filters, which is also the simplest and which I'm sure some of you will recognize if you've worked with Tableau Server as well as Tableau Desktop. And if you've, if you've connected and then um, tried to, to apply this or, or found this in the menus. Um, but applying user filters is using this specific Tableau, this is the Tableau dialog um, functionality to, to apply that. Um, so yes, as a functionality is obviously native to Tableau um, and it's a manual approach as in you will, you will specifically select which person here actually on the left gets to see which members for a certain dimension. And it's, it's actually the quickest way of applying it too. Hence why I think that you know, people on the call here may have seen this already. But rather than just showing you the slide, I think I'd rather um, well, show you the actual uh, demonstration hands-on of, of what this looks like. Um, and to do so, I will use a very simple data set that we have here, uh, which some of you will recognize. This is basically just an aggregated and simplified version of Superstore. Uh, which I'll, I'll load into Tableau. Um, and I guess I could just even like, did you know, well, here's a fun trick. You can copy and paste data from almost anywhere into Tableau. So control C, control V, and here's my data, um, which is, well, my pseudo superstore at category, category and region level. So yeah, securing the data in here, a very, very um, common example in case is, um, you know, managers, for certain regions can see data for their regions. And then, you know, maybe even employees or salespeople in that region can, but people from other regions aren't supposed to see your region's data and vice versa. So, you know, you would want to limit uh, the amount of data that you see based on which region the person consuming the dashboard works in. Um, and yeah, so we have four the four superstore regions here. And I could do that with the user filters, the, the Tableau native functionality that we were just looking at and use that to secure what I will or will not be able to see here as well as other people. Now, I need to sign into the right Tableau server for the examples, um, which I'll, I'll use ours for. Um, so yeah, I'm signed into the server and as soon as I am, an option here becomes available, which is create user filter. And I can create a user filter based on any of the dimensions, or well, that is any of the dimensions where it makes sense, I guess, in my data source. Like, it probably doesn't make much sense to apply role of security based on a date. Like, you can see yesterday's data, but I can see data from two days ago. Um, although you never know, there may be some crazy use cases out there. But again, the, the most common way of, of demonstrating this, which we'll do here too, is like, you know, think of a regional manager allowed to see their region's data. So I'll do that based on the region dimension. And this is the dialog we just saw earlier uh, that pops up. And I'll call this um, user filter I'm gonna create is my region role of all security. And as I was saying, this is quick and easy. This is manual. Uh, I will be selecting people here in this overview, in this dialog, and manually assign the members of the dimensions to them that they can see. So for example, Charles here, could be my central region manager. So I'll assign that one to him. Uh, maybe Chris, one of my other regional managers can see the East region and our friends, uh, let's see, Fabian here might be uh, an actual like C-level uh, executive that gets to see all of the regions and needs that overview. And maybe there's someone else and they get to see two regions, et cetera, et cetera. So I manually apply all of this and then press okay. And what the resulting um, item, the result of this action is that there is a set that has been created, a set, and I'm not gonna go deeper into set functionality in Tableau um, than this, um, but to say that a set is basically a yes or no, true or false evaluation of an expression or of, in this case, who is signed on and what data to get to see based on the region dimension. So I, can, I could use this set anywhere. I can use it in my sheet actually, um, and it automatically gets put in the filters region here. Um, and that means it's applying my role of security because that's what a set as a filter does. 
again, no need for details here, but um, now, well, this disappeared because the person called Timothy Vermeer and myself, uh, I did not select in that dialogue, so I'm unable to see any of the data. So I guess it's working, uh, but I want to make sure that, you know, the appropriate people get to see the appropriate data. And Tableau has a useful little, um, well, I call it this like user simulator for that. Um, it is basically just a selector of all the users on your server here that you can use to do that. And so we're talking about Charles, who is a manager for a region. And when I select him, and I'm now emulating him being signed on to Tableau server, I can actually see that, yes, the central region does pop up um, for him when he's the one consuming this view. And if I am our C-level executive, Fabian, I can actually see all of them. And I can, um, you know, be other people and see the regions that they are allowed to see. Now, this is all good and well, but I'm seeing these as the analyst creating the report in Tableau Desktop. So that means, yes, I get um, the privilege of being able to emulate those. Now, naturally, as you can imagine, once this is published to Tableau Server, if you've taken the right precautions, then it will not be possible for anyone to change that context, right? Um, because, well, that would defeat the whole purpose of being able to secure the data in the view in this way. Uh, now, naturally, this can also be used as a, as a mechanism to do other things than securing data. Um, for example, um, you know, what if there's data in a dashboard that everyone's allowed to see um, but maybe a part of that data is their own and they, you know, you want to highlight that. Well, that's something I could use the set for as well, technically. And there's all kinds of other things you could do and we're not going to go in depth, but this is just to say that, you know, it shouldn't, this, this isn't always a boring topic, but maybe you could highlight uh, a trend line uh, of the region of the person, you know, signed in of the region where they actually work. And that would directly highlight theirs and maybe do a comparison to, to the other regions. Uh, so added interactivity, added context that could be relevant to the users uh, using the dashboard. So um, I'm seeing in the chat that the people are most interested in the copy paste tip that I shared. So at least that's one takeaway that you have. Um, but I hope that this, this will, you know, turn out to be something you can use as well. Um, anyway, this is one technique to apply that, um, that I was uh, referring to. And I, as I was saying, there's other options too. There's two main categories of options, which is one, the user filter, the functionality that we just saw. But two is a more dynamic, more extendable option, which is to apply uh, what I sometimes refer to as the database approach. In other words, you will use your data to actually determine which data can be seen by which user. And that means that, you know, the information of who sees what is not something you will define in Tableau. It's something you will actually pull from the database and read and then apply in Tableau. So, um, yeah, one thing about this approach is that it's source specific because um, different types of databases will obviously work differently when it comes to that. Um, and that's not the point here. We're going to demonstrate how it works in, with a simple example, but just know that depending on what database you use, this might turn out slightly differently or, you know, uh, in other ways. Um, but then as I was saying, so you pull that from the database, but you use Tableau functions like um, username, which we'll see in a moment, to apply it. And like this is a more automated and uh, flexible, enterprise suitable way of applying role-level security. You can go much further with this because obviously you don't want to maintain your user filters that were just uh, showing here. Like, you know, if you got to, you know, change people's access every day, that's not something you're going to be able to do unless you like to get paid to just tick boxes all day. But, you know, I think there's more to Tableau than just that. So to show you, um, I will just, I'm going to edit my data source actually. And, um, well, no, let me create a new one. That's going to be clearer. Uh, connect to Excel and, oh, I'm in the right directory. Uh, what a great day. Um, and maybe, so I was looking at this data here. We will use the same, so region category and sales. Um, but in this same Excel sheet, which could be a database because it's just a table of data after all, I have another table that indicates who my regional managers are and what their names, but then especially what their usernames are. And this is what I'm going to join in to my, you know, like my business data, which I have on one hand, which is just the stuff here, the sales and the region and the category. 
And this is like my security data. So the table that contains my security information in this case, who's the regional manager for that part of the data. And it's quite simple. I take my business data, I join in my regional managers. And as you see, um, you know, well, obviously because I named the fields um, region and region in both, they just, you know, tie up nicely. And I get um, that additional information in here. So step one, as I was saying, you take the information from the database, and that means that we can now use it here in Tableau as well. So we have our region, and that has certain sales. Oops, um, I could double click, but that creates a table, which I dislike. Um, anyway, and then we have the manager names per region as well, and their username. So yes, yeah, step one, take that from the database. Step two, actually apply it in Tableau. So applying this, uh, as mentioned on the slide, makes use of Tableau functionality, uh, no, sorry, well, of a Tableau function even, which is in this case, username. So by habit, I always name this user filter. And then what I need to do is just to make sure that the username here in the data, in the security data that I joined in, is the same as the person who's actually signed in, um, which uses this very Tableau function username, which only works when you're connected to server because you obviously do need that context. Um, but this will return the username of whoever is signed in to the server. In our case, that's in the format of an email address. And I just want to make sure that that matches up. Like, you know, that has to be equal to the manager username. Very, very simple logic, just match. And so as I do that, I get this new field. This is not a set because I, you know, I defined it as a calculated field. But I can now go and use this on color or even here. And you can see, well, None of these actually match, but that's because I'm still signed in as Joffrey Smolders. But what if I am now uh, Ashley Thrin, for example, or Trin, sorry about the mispronunciation of the name there. Um, but you see that this now changes because my username is effectively this one, and I'm now applying rollable security here um, to, this, to this view because, well, I'm not applying it yet, actually. I'm, like, I'm seeing that the filter works, but I would put this here as a filter to actually apply it. Or even better, you could go further and say, well, I'm going to apply this as a data source filter so that everywhere, you know, I only keep the true matching values here and that anything else I built with this data source, like still shows me the right region. And then maybe I'm not Ashley, but I'm Chris Beakley. And then I see, right, I'm the East region manager always being applied. So that's like, you know, this table comes from your database and it can be populated with anything. And this can be information from your enterprise access management tools and everything. So, you know, you can use the right tools that your company has at its disposal to actually apply that. And I realize I have just one minute left, so we're gonna skip quickly through um, the database approaches here. Like, you know, you can, there's different flavors of taking it from the database because I just joined in information. You can union and add a username column. You can pivot all of that information in a way to you can use authentication with a live connection to your DB even. Um, and there's a lot of considerations that will help you select the right one. But, you know, if that's something you need to know about, then probably you're more interested in, um, you know, actually discussing that with someone who has experience around that topic or, or finding out which one works best for you. And there's a lot of resources um, on, on Tableau as documentation to help you make that right choice too. So just to wrap up, um, you know, this, this was all very dry after all, wasn't it? Like, oh, I saw a dashboard with a table and then the rows changed. But just to show you, you can bring a much richer dashboard to your user if you build it properly. Like here, I'm, I'm not signed in as anyone who has access to the data. But again, if I am now James Smith, who is our sales regional manager, well, then this dashboard will look to me like this. Like it says in the title, this is the dashboard for region south and it shows me who I am so that I know, yes, I'm looking at my context or maybe I'm signed in as Yoon and then I get to see my region, uh, oops, looks like that didn't come through in the data. Ashley again, maybe then, right? Central region, different context, different user, different stuff here. Um, but yeah, this can make dashboards much more um, relevant to your users. Like they'll really like that they see their data and um, you know that that's the stuff that they're interested in. And that's just in addition of actually, you know, securing data because you have to. Anyway, I know that I'm at time. So I'll hand back over to Fred, I think, for uh, the closing remarks. And I think questions too. Thank you. Oh, it's Alex, actually. Hey, Alex. Thanks, Tim. Yeah, hand over to me, not to Fred, but that's okay. Um, thanks for that. Um, 
yeah, you said well, it wasn't as creative as Neil, um, but I think from a um, from a from a technical standpoint, it's really interesting. And when I look at the chat, there are a couple of people who um, found that approach quite quite interesting um, in order to to manage what people can see. Um, Sandeep had one question for the for the first option that you showed, and um, what you said or what you did was you defined the um, the user filters on the workbook level, and he was asking if there's any possibility to um, define that wider on a server level, because obviously if you have 10, 20 dashboards and you have to manage that for each of them individually, that's that's quite an effort. Excellent question. Uh, that's true. Um, so you could actually make this part of the data source rather than the workbook. So I'm sure most of you are familiar with the concept of a published data source, where you actually take uh, not not the sheets that you build, but everything that's in the data pane on the left, and you publish that to be reused and connected to multiple workbooks. So any work you do, be it using that user filter built-in functionality or the um, database approach, as we called it, any work you do on that would be part of that published data source. And in fact, if you're going to use this in an, at an enterprise scale, it's very likely that you'll do that. So that you can also define a data source filter in there, ensuring that, you know, someone building the workbook wouldn't forget, quote unquote, to apply the role of all security the way that they should. You would manage it centrally in the published data source. And that would then also, I think, answer Sandeep's question to, you know, lighten the amount of work that has to be done by doing that centrally. Cool. Um, yeah, and I think, as you said, there's a, there's a lot of sort of work to do to be done to apply it consistently and to be, make sure that everybody knows um, what filters to apply and where they where they should apply to. Um, great. Yeah, thanks for the technical overview of the of the role level security. As I said, I think it was quite helpful for for a lot of the users judging by the chat. Um, well, thanks for presenting and thanks for being part of uh, our community. Um, and with that, let me quickly share my screen um, to wrap. Um, to wrap this up. Okay. Um, so we have a couple of announcements. Um, the first one is our next event is next week, Friday. Um, so that will be our ninth community jam. Um, it's suited for US and Europe. And if you're really keen, um, maybe if you are somewhere in, in Asia and you're happy to stay up very late or wake up very early. Um, the links for that and the announcement who's going to speak will go out in the next couple of days, I'm sure. Then um, there is the virtual IT summit um, organized by Tableau. That is also happening next week, um, depending on where you're based, slightly different times. Um, so check this out. Um, the topic is driving change with data and how you can use data within your organization and actually apply or what drive change um, within it. And then lastly, um, as you are all well aware, um, all sorts of in-person events are currently canceled and replaced. Um, as much um, or equally the, the um, conference Euro, which was supposed to be held end of June, um, early July. So that was replaced by Tableau Live. Um, that's a one day digital event. Um, that you can dial in with keynote speakers and network opportunities um, as well as some sort of um, community village. So if you want to take part of that, um, obviously if you're in Europe, it's best suited, um, but because it's virtual, you can obviously also dial in from, from other regions. If you can. Um, so check that out on the Tableau website as well. Um, as I said in the beginning, we recorded the whole session and it will be on YouTube in the next couple of days. So keep an eye out for an email to, um, to check that out and maybe revisit some of the presentations. And with that, I want to thank again all our, presenter, our presenters. Uh, thanks Jorvos, Ashish, Neil and Timothy for, for sharing your work, your experience and your learnings um, across all the different, uh, different projects that you did. Um, thanks to everybody behind the scenes. Thanks to Fred for um, hosting and, and, and uh, introducing the speakers. And thanks to all of you for dialing in um, and participating. 
So I hope to see some of you um, next week or one of the future events. And I hope you have a nice day and a good end of the week.